will start. Uh, you can start see here. and hear me, right? Yes, I can hear you very clearly. Okay. 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 Uh, Sharda ma'am, can you start? Okay. Good evening to one and all. A uh, special and a very warm welcome on this pleasant evening to Dr. Arka Chattopadhyay. We are very happy to have you here, sir. Uh, uh, Dr. Arka uh, uh, Chattopadhyay is very young and dynamic and he keeps on inviting people and uh, keeps us wondering what is the next topic. And today I think we are having modernist literary studies and critical theory. Every time he comes up with a workshop or a seminar, or uh, 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 guest lecture, it's something very new. I hope the uh, participants also enjoy this. Welcome to VAT Chennai, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, I'll Thank just introduce so uh, Dr. Chattopadhyay. I'll read his bio note. Dr. Orko Chattopadhyay is Assistant Professor of Literary Studies and Philosophy in the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences at Indian Institute of Technology, Gandhinagar. He has completed graduation in English literature from Presidency College, now Presidency University. He has completed master's and MPhil in English literature from Jadavpur University, Kolkata. He has written his MPhil thesis on Samuel Beckett and Alan Bodu and finished his PhD from Western Sydney University on Beckett and Lacha. Lacanian psychoanalysis. He has been published in books like Deluge and Beckett, Knots, Post Lacanian Psychoanalysis, Literature and Film, Gerald Marnen, and Their World in This One, etc., and journals such as Textual Practice, Interventions, Samuel Beckett Today, Psychoanalysis, Culture and Society, Sound Studies and Harold Pinter Review. He has co-edited the book, Samuel Beckett and the Encounter of Philosophy and Literature. Dr. Chattopadhyay is the chief editor of the online literary journal, Shongla, and a contributing editor to Harold Pinter Review. His first monograph, Beckett, Laka, and the Mathematical Writing of the Real, has been published by Bloomsbury Academic UK in 2019. He has recently co-edited a volume on Navarun Bhattacharya for Bloomsbury Academic in 2020 and is working on another volume on body and modernism. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, Professor Mukherjee, for this uh, very kind invite, and uh, Professor Rajkumar, uh, thank you for this very warm welcome and the introductory words. So I will uh, be talking about the, the contemporary research trends in uh, modernist studies, and rather than you know offering one narrative, I'll be talking about divergent uh, critical interests and divergent critical paradigms that have emerged in the study of literary modernism in the last 10, 15, 20 years, and especially some of the recent trends in that, I mean, uh, staying true to the, the, the theme of the, the, the program here. Uh, just before we start, if I could get a rough sense, because I'll pitch myself accordingly, if I could get a rough sense whether uh, the audience is, I mean, I'm just wondering about the disciplinary backgrounds of the audience. Is it primarily literary studies? Is it uh, uh, different uh, varieties or different disciplines within humanities and social sciences? If I could get a very rough idea, maybe not. I, I know. I don't. I know we do not have the time to go one by one. But possibly, if, if Professor Mukherjee or Professor Rajkumar could give give me a very brief idea about the backgrounds. Most of us. Participants are from English literature backgrounds. Uh, okay. They are okay. most of them are faculties of some uh, colleges or universities, and they have a background in literature. Yes. Yes. Wonderful. That's and that's there are a few good. research scholars also. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. They are also from good. the same background. Right. Right. Thank you so much. That's that's always good to know because I can pitch myself accordingly if it's a 
if it's a mixed audience, I'll have to sort of talk with certain assumptions, right? Okay, thank you so much. Uh, so I'll start talking about modernist studies. So of course, uh, to be uh, speaking the obvious to begin with, uh, by the period of literary modernism, we primarily talk about the first two or three decades, especially of the so-called high modernism in Europe. And modernist studies as a field developed with that kind of very strong European focal point and a certain literary periodization that we do in, in, in uh, the history of literature. And uh, of course, we have some very important canonical names there, such as James Joyce, T.S. Eliot, Virginia Woolf, and especially if we think of 1922 as a very important year, the publication of Eliot's Wasteland, as well as Joyce's Ulysses. And there's a certain uh, set of notions associated with modernism, such as a certain notion of literary experiment to, to go back to a very, uh, a, a somewhat, uh, you know, one of the very early foundational books about modernism from a literary critic like C.M. Baurer, who uh, singled out this particular notion of experiment. And of course, uh, we have these various ideas of avant-garde literature or experimental literature. So avant-garde is a military term which is developed in uh, modernist studies primarily to talk about this idea of literature as innovation or literature as experiment. Uh, to talk again, to mention someone like Ezra Pound, one of the commonest uh, sort of uh, axioms that we always talk about in modernist studies is Pound's idea, make it new, make everything new. So this particular thrust towards uh, innovation, innovation in textual form, innovation in the, the, the very rubric of the text that is, is being written, that is being crafted. Uh, these are some of the very foundational ideas of modernism, right? I mean, where in certain ways, modernism would pitch itself in relation to a certain idea of literary orthodoxy, or what Eliot in that famous essay would call tradition. Tradition and the individual talent is the essay I'm thinking about. And Eliot would talk about a certain historical sense in modernist writers, which would allow them to situate themselves in a dialectical relation with tradition. So the dialectical tension is between something like tradition and something like modernity, let's say. But of course, there is no single homogeneous narrative of modernity. And, and this is one, one aspect that we will develop and discuss as we go along. So, to, to briefly sort of lay out the, the different trends that I would want to talk about, uh, I know that we do not have a lot of time, so I'll be brief on each of these things and we could come back uh, in the discussion times. Uh, so one of the most important things that have happened uh, in modernist studies, especially in the last 20 years or so, is uh, let's say post 2000 in the 21st century, is to revise the modernist canon. From, from various you know, points of view. So from this uh, you know, historical periodization of high modernism in the 30s and the major writers, especially the three, three or four big names I mentioned, such as Eliot, Joyce, Pound, Wolf, uh, and you know, moving into late modernism, the likes of Beckett to move beyond Europe, uh, Jorge Luis Borges, the Argentinian writer, and then moving over to the, the, the late modernist, quasi postmodernist writers like Italo Calvino. And, and postmodernism, of course, comes in a big way uh, through American fiction. The likes of, I mean, uh, to go a little bit further down, someone like Don DeLillo, or, or again, going back a little bit further, Thomas Pynchon, uh, John Barth. Uh, John Barth is a, a literary novelist, but he wrote two very influential essays, which were extremely important for this paradigm shift from modernism to postmodernism. The first one was called literature of exhaustion. The second one was called literature of replenishment. And he was talking about a certain movement beyond modernism in texts such as Gabriel Garcia Marquez's 100 Years of Solitude. That was one of the texts he would single out in that essay to talk about a movement beyond modernism. So one of the things that we often see in modernism is a certain kind of shock effect and uh, what is often called uh, an opposition created between 
a popular literary form and a so-called literary fiction, a high artistic literary form. So these two terms are often used in modern studies, high art and low art, to talk about popular literary forms when we say low art and, and relatively more, let's say, recondite forms, forms that are more complex, more ambivalent, because in certain ways, what is at the core of modernist aesthetics is a notion of mystery, a notion of ambivalence, that literature is not a completely transparent medium. And the experiments with literature would also be experiments with literary meaning in a text. And different ways of thinking about this uh, experiment was to push the polyvalence of a literary text, multiple possibilities of meaning that a literary text would have. So pushing open this, 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 this polyvalence of literary text, and not just polyvalence, but also ambivalence, where the, the meaning would never be decided upon by the author, or it cannot be decided upon by the, the author-reader interface either, because each reader would, of course, change that interface. Uh, the, the text would speak differently, as we know, to, to each of the readers. So in different ways, uh, if we go back to the, the period that I'm talking about from the 20s, 30s onwards, even if we look at the history of literary criticism, some of these ideas become very important, such as, for example, Seven Types of Ambiguity is one of the books that talks about, uh, one of the, again, rather orthodox literary criticism books that talks about this idea of ambivalence or, or you know, multi multiplicity of meanings, uh, you know, undecidedness of meaning, not just multiplicity, but also undecidedness of meaning. Uh, and again, there are these attempts to think of a text sometimes in a very radical way, divesting it from its historical context. I mean, as you know, one of the most interesting experiments back in the day in the, in the 20s and 30s was the, the School of Practical Criticism. Uh, I.A. Richards uh, was one of the uh, leaders of that school. And one of the things that Richards would often do is to come to the classroom and give a poem or give a short story to his students without revealing any detail about the writer, about the background of the writer, about what historical period that text comes from, and just allow the readers, the, the students in this case, to read without these contextual informations. I mean, in an interesting way now with the advent, and we'll, we'll very soon talk about that, the advent of you know, world literature, post-colonial studies, global modernisms, the tendency is exactly in the other way around. Uh, now we are talking about hyper-contextualization, whereas someone like Richards would talk about a kind of hypo-contextualization, if I may say, uh, very little contextualization and letting the text speak almost radically devoid of its context, which is, of course, a very controversial move. But the point was to see whether different interpretations of a text can emerge if we completely mute the context mute the historical context or the authorial details around the text. So some of this radical textualism, what could be called a radical textualism, was also part of the, the whole modernist debate around literature. Uh, there was a critique of realism, which was, again, very strong in modernist circles in terms of you know, the, the movement beyond that idea that a text, a literary text, will have to somehow historically correspond with a reality outside the text. And as you know, I mean, one of the initial uh, battles between uh, the Marxist literary critics and the modernist uh, literary uh, writers uh, hinged on this idea. If we look at the works of, especially the early appreciations of modernism in the Marxist literary circles, especially the Hungarian Marxist Georg Lukács, we would see that for Lukács, modernism was naturalism. And Lukács, of course, mistakenly identified photography as that kind of naturalist form. Uh, of course, Lukács's assumption was that photography is neutral. You just capture a frame as it is. There is no perspective there. 
there is no political content. So Lukács thought modernism was apolitical, and that was his major point of critique when it came to modernism. We saw with time, with the likes of Raymond Williams and other uh, post lukacian uh, literary critics who had a, a move, sort of a leaning towards the left, and, and much later, Terry Eagleton, they would complicate this question, of course. I mean, when we look at Raymond Williams, for example, Marxism and literature, we see how the ways of interpreting a writer like Kafka has changed from Lukács. So Lukács was extremely critical of Kafka and a lot of modernist writers for being apolitical, for not being able to take a stand. But this whole idea, what is the politics of modernism? What, what is politics in literature? How can a literary text be political? Is it only through the historical representational content that a literary text becomes political? Or can it be political in some aesthetic form through the different experiments it makes? So that's, a, that's, a, that's of course a large question, but this was one of the major points of debate again when it came to uh, politics of modernism. Williams, Raymond Williams wrote this book called Politics of Modernism Later, which is a collection of essays talking about the different political positions in modernism. Of course, the politics was varied. There was the extreme right-wing politics of you know, a group like Futurism. There was also a very strong left-wing leaning when it came to surrealism, Dadaism, and some of these anarchist movements, uh, proto-anarchist movements, let's say, in, uh, within modernism. So again, we are talking about a very vast and a very complicated uh, social political trajectory. But the idea of committed literature, politically committed literature, wasn't absent in modernism. So, for example, Sartre, Jean-Paul Sartre, the French writer, he wrote this famous text called What is Literature, uh, which had a very strong notion of the writer as a committed uh, entity, what he called the engagé writer, the engaged writer. So the socially, politically engaged writer. So not that social and political commitment was completely missing in modernist circles, but there was a certain notion of autonomy the autonomy of art, you know, to go back to this, again, this very famous book uh, from the, the, the late 70s and 80s, Peter, Peter Berger. Peter Berger wrote this book called The Theory of the Avogad. And in The Theory of the Avogad, uh, Berger does this very famous historical uh, mapping of literature and how, you know, so his, his central argument about avogad modernist literature is that there's a certain critique of this artistic autonomy in the avant-garde literature. So he's not saying that the avant-garde literature takes this artistic autonomy for granted. In fact, he's saying, he, he's arguing that modernist literature, avant-garde literature, critiques this autonomy of art. What is autonomy of art? The notion that art could be independent of society or art could be independent of social politics, right? So in certain ways, uh, with and Berger, again, we are talking about a very clearly Marxian sort of a discourse in Berger. I mean, that, that's the focus of that book to, to again, uh, defend, in a way, modernist art uh, up against someone like Lukács to defend it on a broad left socialist kind of a leaning. So again, we have this uh, complex history of modernist literature as well as modernist literary criticism. I tried to very briefly touch upon that. Of course, again, we could come back to each of these things uh, while we are talking about, uh, uh, while we are having the Q&A at the end. So to continue as a research field, modernist literary studies, of course, developed around some of these very important writers, as I said, but in the last 20 years, to go back to a thread I opened up, there was a major tendency to revise modernist canon, revise the canon and to go beyond some of these uh, very well-known writers. So just to give you a general idea of how this uh, interventions, how these interventions happened beyond the canon, one could think of the very important work of feminist modernisms, for example, which came up in the last 20 years or so. And uh, just to, again, give you a general idea, I mean, it's because of a certain uh, male-dominated literary history uh, beyond, and again, if you think of the only writer in the high modernist canon who was there from the very beginning, Virginia Woolf, again, Virginia Woolf uh, 
because of Leonard Wolf, her husband, had very strong connections in the publishing circle, which is why she could publish herself so widely, uh, almost uh, at par with the other modernist, the, 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 the male writers. But if we think of the other important modernist writers, they were in a way excavated in the last 20, 30 years. They were not really considered a big part or a big chunk of modernism. So uh, at least three writers one could mention here, of course, there are others too. Uh, Mina Loy, who was a uh, part of the surrealist group in a way. Uh, and, and later on, she, again, a very interesting writer. She wrote uh, a, something called a feminist manifesto, which was in the 20th century, one of the, uh, or perhaps the only manifesto of feminism to be written by a modernist writer. And she wrote short stories. She wrote these chap books, uh, these small booklets. Uh, some of them were short stories. Uh, some of them were little no novellas. She was a sketch artist, uh, someone who had a very strong journalistic background as well. So Mina Loy is again a very interesting case. Gertrude Stein, who is perhaps the most well-known of these writers, who were in a way excavated and, and, and put back into the modernist canon, as it were. But again, someone like Gertrude Stein was better known as Picasso's muse and some of, you know, in these relational identities. Uh, for a long time, one didn't take her own works, as in her novels, her poetry, uh, a little more seriously than one, one should have. Uh, so again, Gertrude Stein was another very important writer who was sort of put, put back into circulation, as it were, in terms of this feminist intervention into the canon of modernism. Uh, so Mina Loy, Gertrude Stein, again, one could think of a writer like Anna Kevan, uh, another very important writer who was uh, underread and underregarded in a certain way. The novel, especially I have in mind, is Ice. Uh, and again, it's a very interesting uh, history. Uh, her history with mental illness, her history with addiction. Uh, this was not the, the name that she used earlier on when she wrote some of her uh, initial novels. She was in an asylum for a long time, and it's only in the asylum that she started to write in the pseudonym of Anna Kevan. And Anna Kevan was the name of one of her characters going back to one of the earlier novels. And again, so it's very interesting negotiation uh, that we have in, in, in Kavan's work. And Ice is now considered a sort of a, an avant-garde masterpiece, but it wasn't uh, back in the day. So we could uh, make an argument uh, about the, the feminist writers, for example. Uh, another interesting writer here would be Juna Barnes, uh, D-J-U-N-A. It's a slightly weird uh, spelling, so I'm mentioning it here. Juna Barnes. So Juna Barnes is again, I mean, the novel that uh, is perhaps most widely read now is uh, Nightwood. And it's a novel that was published by Faber under the tutelage of Thomas Stearns Eliot, of course. And Eliot had a very, uh, again, a very debatable editorial policy here. Eliot uh, chucked out large portions of the novel. And again, I'm mentioning this because here we have again a classic instance of a female writer who is edited out by one of the gurus of modernism. I mean, Eliot and Pound, these two were uh, two very important, almost controlling figures of Anglo-American modernism. And it's important because both of them had that very complicated mixed transnational background, right? I mean, uh, and, and uh, that, that's, that's an interesting point. But in any case, so Juna Barnes, Mina Loy, Gertrude Stein, and Anna Kevan four interesting cases of uh, peripheral modernism. So the, the, the point I'm trying to make is, you know, how these peripheral modernisms emerge in due course, and they emerge through various uh, discourses of exclusion, one discourse being patriarchy, and the feminist modernism was one of those, you know, ways of expanding the canon of modernism. If you are more interested, you could read Alex Goody's book, called Modernist Articulations. It's a book by Alex Goody, G-O-O-D-Y, and it's called Modernist Articulations. It's a, it offers a very detailed reading of these three writers I mentioned, not Anna Kevan, but Barnes, Loy, and Stein. So that's feminist modernism. That's one uh, quick point I wanted to mention in, in this larger idea of uh, intervening into the modernist canon. Now, 
I mean, of course, modernist studies is an extremely diverse field, and I will not be able to open up all possible threads. But let me just briefly mention a few things. If you're interested, again, we could come back to this. So other than a very, uh, again, a very uh, expansive and a very diverse array of critical theories, modernist studies has also been very strongly, uh, I don't know whether subjected is the right word, but uh, let's say prone to an archival turn, a materialist archival turn. So that's another point to keep in mind. The kind of work that has gone into the manuscripts of James Joyce, Samuel Beckett, uh, uh, recent, more recently, James Kodzia, and many other writers. I mean, that's again an important point to keep in mind, how digital humanities and various kinds of manuscript studies have inflected modernist studies. So, for example, uh, now when we write about various modernist texts, it's almost necessary uh, in more ways than one to compare the texts in terms of their various archival counterparts, their drafts, how the text is uh, changing, how, how, how various ideas are dropped off or incorporated in the final version, what kind of changes are made. So a very detailed comparative manuscript studies. And again, to mention one book, which you might want to read in this context, uh, Dirk Van Hull, H-U-L-L-E. Dirk Van Hull has a, has a book called Modern, Modern Manuscripts. And it's a very interesting book because he, he goes into, uh, again, a detailed uh, reading of various modern manuscripts from Wolf to Beckett and others. But the, the interesting point is he reads the manuscripts of writers in relation to the extended mind hypothesis in cognitive theories. So there's a certain inclination there to read the manuscript as the extended mind. The extended mind in the sense, so, I mean, for those of you who may not be familiar with the extended mind hypothesis, the idea is where you write, and the surface you use, the, the kind of object you use in the process of writing becomes a sort of mental map. And the, the mind in terms of its cognitive system is coupled with that object. So to give an obvious example, when Jack Kerouac, the, the famous American beat writer, wrote this novel, one of his most famous novels, On the Road, he wrote it on a scroll. Right, the entire book, the novel, was first composed on a scroll. And it has been variously argued by Kerouac and other modernist scholars that the scroll itself becomes the road. And, and in a way, the whole novel is a travel novel. It's about being on the road. And the surface on which Kerouac writes, the scroll, determines the kind of narrative he's developing. So this is, again, a very simple uh, albeit too simple, possibly, example of this, this, this connection between the extended, by, the extended mind hypothesis in embodied mind theories and the modern manuscript in all its different draft forms, right? And as we know, I mean, there is a certain argument that has been made about, especially when it comes to cognitive philosophy of mind, uh, that in the mind, writing happens sometimes in that sort of multi-track editorial manner where you erase certain parts of it, you rewrite, you edit. So there's a certain editorial theory that has sometimes been evoked in the cognitive theories of the mind. So it's, it's a two-way process in that way. But I wanted to mention uh, 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 Dirk's work because it, it engages with uh, these ideas of manuscript studies, archival turn. But I, I hope you get the basic point, which is that modernism as a as a, as, a, as a field of uh, research concentration has really woken up to the archives of all these different writers and what we can do with these different archives. And it's important to consult these archival versions, to visit the archives uh, physically or digitally to, to consult them. And that's become, in a way, part of the, the modernist uh, method of reading on, in, 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 and engagement. Now, to, to continue with this, I mean, these uh, different tracks that I'm, I'm trying to introduce, maybe one or two, and then we could have a conversation. 
Um, so another important interest area in modernism, especially in recent times, has been the interest in studying uh, history of science in various ways, history and philosophy of science within modernism. Because if we think of modernism outside literature, especially in the, the domain of sciences, the notion of scientific modernity is often built around certain basic ideas in physics, mathematics, for example, Einstein and the notion of relativity, the theory of relativity. So Paul Sheehan and others have worked on the importance of Einsteinian theories, scientific modernity in relation to uh, uh, modernism, literary modernism. Uh, for example, in the last few years, and in a way, the book that I wrote that came out of my thesis was part of this general interest. There has been a very strong interest in mathematics and modernism. And very recently, I was reviewing three books which came out uh, in the last, all in the last uh, three, four years, one on Joyce and geometry, uh, the other on modernism and, and, and mathematics in a more general way. Uh, Nina Engelhardt is the, the writer there. In fact, that was the first of these three books that came out on uh, mathematics and modernism. And Bailey Brits wrote a book called Literary Infinities, I think about three or four years back, came out just before mine. And so there's, again, a certain interest in uh, mathematical modernism. And again, we could talk at length about this much later if, if some of you are interested, but I just want to open up the thread as an example of this interest in history of science, philosophy of science, uh, and a cultural history of science. So what kind of transformations happen in mathematics? So someone like Jeremy Gray in a book called Plato's Ghost, and Gray is a mathematician and a philosopher. She, so, so Gray in that book, Plato's Ghost, talks about the modernist transformation of mathematics. So what do we mean by modernist mathematics? And he opens up that dialogue in various other disciplines too, arguing that there could be parallel uh, modernisms, just as there's a modernism in mathematics, there could be parallel modernisms in other fields, art, literature, and so on. And a lot of these interests have, you know, concentrated around works such as Gray's. And, and for example, again, to go into uh, cognitive theories, uh, George Lakoff, the famous cognitive linguist, and Rafael Nunez, they wrote a book called Where Mathematics Comes From, where they made this argument about cultural mathematics, mathematics as an embodied cultural practice. So mathematics is not just this a uh, historical phenomenon. For example, uh, just to give a very simple and micro example, we often count numbers like this, right? So we use the lines on our fingers to count numbers. As you can see in this movement, which a child starts doing, in fact, in certain ways, a child would do this, this, one, two, three, and so on. There's a connection between numbers and the body. And these cultural practices, of course, could change from one community to another. So there have been recent works on the cultural history of numbers, again, in 20th century, in 21st century, across different cultures. A lot of this work has come from cognitive linguistics, but there's also work uh, that is interested, as I said, in literature and numbers, literature and counting. Uh, I would uh, recommend Nina Engelhardt's book, which came out from EUP, Edinburgh University Press. Uh, it's called Modernism and Fiction, uh, uh, Modern Fic Mathematics and Modern Fiction, I think. Uh, so again, there's been an interest in various scientific notions of modernity and how they influenced uh, literary modernism. For example, time, you know, relativity and the question of time there becomes very important. As we know, uh, time is one of those extremely important literary tropes in modernism. I mean, think about someone like Marcel Proust. Uh, I will finish maybe with another uh, point, and it's, it's, a, it's an important point, so I do want to spend maybe five, five minutes, five to ten minutes on this, and then we could open up to conversation. How are we doing for time, by the way, Professor Mukherjee? Are we good? Sir, you can take uh, five or 10 minutes or 15 oh, okay, minutes. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. So uh, let me very briefly talk about global modernism studies. And global modernism is one of the most important uh, formations uh, that have, in a way, come across in uh, modernist studies as a field 
in the last 10 years especially and i'll, I'll uh, sort of direct you to some particular book sources here which would be helpful uh, especially in in the context of uh, this this talk because there's a pedagogic aspect to this talk i'm presenting the research developments more than my own arguments and my own research so uh, to to continue the idea is i mean and this was a very interesting negotiation within modernist studies so just as there was this feminist intervention which opened up the modernist canon beyond certain male writers or dominantly male writers there was also a very strong intervention into modernism as a global phenomenon where of course we will have to think about modernisms in the plural right and there could be different ways in which modernist ideas travel across the world so some of these frameworks were developed uh, primarily around literary history and cultural history to talk about how modernism travels. Now, there could be derivative provincial discourses of modernism in different parts of the world, or there could be coeval modernisms. So, for example, a writer like Amitav Ghosh has often argued that there's a certain coeval development of modernism that happens in Europe and in various other countries almost at the same time. So it's not always true that through the colonial encounter, modernist ideas reached the, so, the shores of East Asia or you know, South, South Asia and so on. That, that is partially true, of course, but there were also indigenous modernisms within each of these countries that we are talking about. And we cannot possibly think of all these modernisms in the same way. Argentinian modernism is not the same as European modernism. For example, there was, a, there was a movement in Spain and Argentina uh, much before the initial developments of European modernism called Modernismo, which is not exactly a counterpart of European modernism. So we have to talk about how modernism travels across the world and how there are these coeval developments in different parts of the world, which could all be called modernisms, but in different ways. So basically a critique of a certain Eurocentric definition of modernism was conducted. And that was one of the essential spirits in this expansion of global modernist studies. So just to, again, give you some uh, bearings in terms of the kind of work that gets done in the field and, and also some of the recent uh, books in the field that you might want to look into. So one major area of discussion in global modernism is the form of something like the little magazine, the small presses or the little magazines. I'll quickly mention two works here. One is this uh, famous book by Eric Bulson called Little Magazine as World Form, if memory serves right. Let me just double check the title once. Uh, it was part of this series called Modernist Latitudes. Yes, Little Magazine World Form by Eric Bulson, B-U-L-S-O-N. So Bulson argues that Little Magazine is a world form and it's not uh, essentially French or German or any, uh, it, it's not national in nature the way it travels and it travels everywhere across the world, uh, you know, it makes it a world form. So when we talk about global modernism around this idea of world literature, global modernisms, and not just European or, you know, particular national or, or regional modernisms, of course, it's an intersectional framework. I mean, there is no one modernism here. It's a network. It's a network of different kinds of modernism. But Little Magazine often becomes a hub. As we know, each magazine would have its own set of writers, its own set of practices. If you think of it, all the major literary movements within modernism, even within the European modernism, they had a magazine for them. The, the, the Surrealists would have a magazine. Dadaists would have a magazine. And in fact, the other day in the National University of Singapore, there was a conference about... Uh, uh, world uh, global modernisms and in fact there was there was a very interesting paper on taiwanese little magazines and and various taiwanese little magazines that used certain surrealist ideas back in the day and we're talking about 30s and 40s here uh, but but also uh, you know ideas that emerged from taiwanese literature so there's a very complex negotiation of the global and the local and there's often a local adaptation 
an appropriation of the, the European form. Even when it travels, it is in a way adapted and appropriated by the local traditions. So Eric Bulson is one important work that I wanted to mention. Uh, this idea of uh, global, sorry, a literary magazine, uh, li little magazines as world form. There's another uh, book that I wanted to mention here. Just give me a second. I'll try and, uh, if one of you have unmuted yourself, it'll be wonderful if you could please mute yourself because I can hear all this noise. Uh, thank you. Uh, right. So, uh, yeah, the book that I had in mind, just give me a second, let me find the title. Uh, yes, Sophie Sieta, and I think the book is called Peripheral Avogad, but let me double check the title. So Sophie Sieta, S-E-I-T-A, she uh, again argues primarily about the little magazine as a kind of global form. So that's one uh, inclination within global modernism. Uh, Two other important books, let me mention, because again, they might be uh, important for some of you to go into and, and, and read through. So one is this, uh, this is not just global modernism, so this one that I'm mentioning right now is called A Handbook of Modernism Studies. It's a very representative and a very important book. It came out in 2013 from uh, Willie Blackwell. It was edited by the famous modernist scholar Jean-Michel Rabate. Uh, R-A-B-A-T-E, Rabate, and it is called A Handbook of Modernism Studies. And again, it's, it's a very interesting book to read because it gives you a very clear idea of what these research concentrations are. For example, there's a strong interest in corporeality, how the body is represented in modernism. There is an interest from a medical humanities aspect uh, or a medical humanities perspective on various modernist texts. Of course, some of the older ideas of form, style, and so on, they're very much there, but they're couched in a, in a, in a different way now. But to, to continue with this uh, brief sort of you know, uh, bibliography that I'm trying to uh, offer you. So the, the other one, the other book that I wanted to mention here is a, a, dictionary, a Dictionary of Global Modernism. So A Dictionary of Global Modernism, this was recently uh, edited by Eric Hyatt. H-A-Y-O-T, and uh, let me see, I think it's Wachowitz, who's the second one? Yes, Eric Hyatt and Rebecca Wachowitz. It's called A New Vocabulary for Global Modernism. And this is uh, written in the form of a dictionary. The, the book is written in the form of a dictionary, and it goes into you know, concepts such as uh, form, copy, libraries, uh, pantomime, puppets, style, tradition, translation, uh, alienation. So it's a, it's a conceptual dictionary for global modernism. And again, it has contributions from very important uh, people, very important scholars in the field, such as Jalal Kabir, Jahan Ramazani, and these, these writers who have, again, created that uh, notion of global modernism outside its, its European framework. Uh, so again, we're talking about African negotiations, Indian negotiations, Japanese modernisms. And this transnational tendency, by the way, was always there. It's not that it's a new phenomenon. It was there in high modernism as well. I mean, as early as 1915, we have a, a book by uh, Pound, Ezra Pound, where he translates classical Chinese poetry. So uh, we know that there are these negotiations. For example, Pound also writes on Tagore, uh, a very enthusiastic, perhaps an over-enthusiastic piece on Tagore, uh, very early on in, in the early 1910s and 15s, uh, round about the same time when he translates Chinese poetry. We know the, the relationship between Tagore and Yeats, another very important modernist poet, and the, the, the interest that Yeats had in what he called the Asiatic form. So there was a soft orientalist interest, uh, and I, I say soft orientalist because there was a tendency to exoticize the East. There was a tendency to exoticize the East in uh, European modernist uh, exponents. So if you, if you see the introduction that Yeats famously writes to Tagore's book of poems, Song Offerings, you would see how he wants to project Tagore as this Eastern sage. But in any case, so the point I'm trying to make is this was always there. 
there was always a very strong intersection, a transnational intersection. I mean, Elliot and Pound himself themselves hailed from America, though they settled down in UK. And so modernism was always a transnational movement. I mean, uh, Joyce and Beckett, uh, Beckett even started writing in French. Both Joyce and Beckett would spend a substantial amount of time in Switzerland and France away from their own countries. Uh, Ionesco was Romanian, but uh, his, his plays are written in French. So there's always this translingual, transnational dimension. In fact, the whole of the left bank in France in the 40s and 50s uh, was full of, uh, I mean, these, these emigre writers. They were called emigre. I mean, Barnes herself was an emigre. Uh, expatriate writers who are for various social, political, individual conflicts who have left their countries and who are in another country. So transnational modernism was always there if, if we go back to the historical context. But these are things that have been picked up in recent past. I'll, I'll finish now with one final reference to a book, uh, which again, I think is a, is a new book and it would be helpful uh, for, for anyone interested in global modernism to read this. Uh, Alice Moody and others, they came up again. Let me just double check the title once. Uh, just give me a second. Uh, Alice Moody and others, they edited this new volume on global modernism. I think it's called Global Modernists on Modernism, and it's an anthology. But I think, again, it's a very important source book to read because, uh, yes, it's called Global Modernists on Modernism, an anthology. It came out earlier this year from Bloomsbury. So again, there are all these uh, new kinds of work that try and negotiate the various kinds of modernisms that are developed under very different social, political, uh, ethnic, indigenous contexts in different parts of the world. And there's a certain notion of world form there, such as the little magazine and many other forms uh, that, that travel across the, across the borders. So very briefly to sum up now, I talked about different kinds of uh, scientific modernities and an engagement with different uh, philosophies and histories of science in modern studies as a trend. Uh, I talked about global modernism studies. I also briefly talked about the, the expansion of the canon along the lines of gender. But of course, we could also talk about the expansion of the canon along the lines of race, caste, class, and so on. And, and that would again, be one of those negotiations between post-colonial studies and modernist studies. So a writer, for example, just again to give an instance, a writer like Jean Rees. Jean Rees, in terms of her style, is a modernist writer in more ways than one. But then Rees, because of her own context, I mean, her own upbringing as a, a, a mixed race woman, as a, you know, as, as a, as a quote-unquote white woman in the Creole, Again, and, and we know the famous work, White Sargasso Sea, where she rewrites uh, the, the, the novel Jane Eyre, right? So there are these ways in which we can combine the post-colonial and the modernist literary studies to come up with a certain global modernism. Again, uh, if we, uh, I'll, I'll end here, I know we are, uh, run, we've run out of time, but uh, very briefly, I'll, I'll mention two writers here. Again, someone like Salman Rushdie and someone like Anita Desai, who are two very important post-colonial writers in the Indian context, in the South Asian context. But again, both these writers have had a very complex mixed lineage and a very strong association with modernism. So as we know, I mean, uh, uh, Rushdi, in fact, was one of the editors and one of the introducers of the centennial edition of Beckett's works. He also uh, read parts of the letters when they came out and later. And, and his latest work is a reworking of Don Quixote, one of those very important reference points for modernist canons. And again, someone like Anita Desai, if we follow the arc of her work, again, there's a certain content that would bring in questions of uh, post-colonialism in, in her work, but the style, the structure of her work is often very strongly influenced by modernism. So again, we have to think of these intersectional ways of bridging the gap through global modernism between modernist studies and you know, various kinds of new literatures, post-colonial literatures across the world. And that attempt is something that 
has been done and is being done as we speak. So maybe I'll stop here and there might be questions and I'm happy to take them. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, I request the participants to ask questions. Participants can ask questions. Yeah, please feel free to ask your questions. Because I think can I ask a question? Sure. Yes, ma'am. Okay, uh, I am from Asansol Bidhan Chandra College. I'm Troy Sinha. Uh, I just, uh, I mean, thank you so much uh, for the lecture because after the post graduation days, it is really very uh, encouraging to go through this kind of, you know, it's a refreshment. You can uh, think of the refreshing of the memory. So I just wondering if there is anything called marginality in modernism. I mean, is there anything like this? I was just wondering to know. Right, right. So, yeah, I mean, definitely. And I think Sophie Sieta's work, if I'm remembering the title properly, it, it is peripheral avant-garde, right? So there is a very, in fact, this whole uh, movement towards global modernism studies was uh, informed and in a way motivated by these notions of margin, that one has to go beyond uh, European modernism to see how European modernism through various kinds of translations, appropriations travel across the world. So when we talk about world literature, one of the most significant sort of, you know, opening points in this, this, in this field of world literature was David Damrosh's work. And, and I'm thinking of the book, What is World Literature? So Damrosh theorized this idea of how literature travels from a host culture to a guest culture and how literature changes in course of this reception. So again, to, to give an Indian example, uh, you know, in, in, the, in the series Historicizing Modernisms, there was uh, a few years back, there was this book on Arun Kolatkar and, and Indian modernism. So that's again an example. And there was another book on Rushdie and, and, and Indian modernisms. Uh, if we think of all the bhasha traditions in Indian literature, for example, and how they appropriate modernist ideas, it's very important. I mean, uh, because uh, my mother tongue is Bengali, I could give one example from there because I've, in a way, uh, worked on some of these writers as well. So, for, for example, if we think of a writer like Shubimol Misro, who's considered, again, a little magazine writer, uh, a writer from the experimental Bengali tradition. He was, he was recently, uh, not so recently, but in the last four or five years, he has been translated by uh, P. Ramaswamy into, into English and HarperCollins has published some of his books. So if you're interested, of course, you could look him up otherwise. But Shubhimal is an interesting figure because Shubhimal uses a lot of these cut up techniques which come to him through a, a series of sources such as you know, I, Eisenstein, the filmmaker Eisenstein's idea of uh, montage, uh, the French filmmaker, uh, Eisenstein is a Russian filmmaker, the French filmmaker Godard's idea of the jump cut, but also William Burroughs, another modernist beat writer. Uh, we mentioned Kerouac earlier. Uh, Burroughs's idea of the cut up, and this again goes back to Surrealist Manifesto. So if we see the manifesto for Surrealism, Breton, in the middle of the manifesto towards the end has this whole collage where an entire poem is made from newspaper cutouts. And this was a, a very important modernist form, what was called cut up by, by Glissant and, and, and William Burroughs. Now, Shubhimal Misro adopts these ideas, but then he uses a very complex indigenous, almost a local context and local content to you know, deploy these cut-ups. And in the process, they become Indianized in a way. So again, these are the kind of negotiations uh, that are at work when we talk about the cultural or the, the, let's say, the social economic margins. So you're absolutely right that there's a certain notion of marginality here. In fact, world literature as a framework came from world system analysis, right? And world system analysis had very strong notions of center and periphery. So, yeah, I mean, sorry, we could go on, but maybe I'll, I'll take other questions if there are any. Thank you. Thank you for the answer. Thank you. Any other questions?
Uh, sir, uh, this is uh, Niranjana. I'm a research scholar at uh, VIT. Uh, I would like to know, uh, is there any point of convergence uh, with postmodernism when modernism uh, is been uh, taking forms like this? I mean, uh, it is, uh, it's kind of looking like a uh, multidisciplinary and uh, interdisciplinary and things like yes. that. So yes. is there any point of conver convergence that is happening with postmodernism? I would like you to throw light on it, sir. Thank you, Niranjana. That was a very good question. So uh yeah i mean one of the things that has happened over the years is that uh some of these and this is a, a, of course very tricky because some of these postmodernist writers have also been reappropriated into modernism that's again something to sort of keep in mind because again when we think of uh, a writer like thomas pynchon uh, he has been equally claimed by modernism and postmodernism, right? Mm -hmm. So another way of thinking about this is to see a sort of a continuum as well. Of course, there are aspects of postmodernist writing that go against modernism, especially if we think of this, this, this idea that I mentioned earlier on, this hierarchy of high forms and low forms. Because postmodernism, as we know, developed this idea of what is called avant pop, so just as there's avant-garde, there is this notion of the avant-pop, which would fuse uh, extremely complex literary forms with popular forms. So we see a whole lot of these works, for example, in Umberto Eco and uh, you know, a lot of these writers, John Fuller, who uh, use very popular forms like science fiction. Uh, Philip K. Dick comes to mind, another important writer in that context. So science fiction, and who done it detective narratives these two become very important popular forms to in a way experiment with so to go back to your question if we look at uh, I'll, I'll mention one uh, critic here because he's i think very important in this movement that you're talking about from modernism to postmodernism brian mckell so brian mckell wrote a very influential book called postmodern fictions uh, i think in the 80s early 80s and recently, uh, in post-2010, I'm not sure about the year, he wrote another book on postmodernism, which came back to some of these ideas. And we can see how there are more continuities than discontinuities between modernism and postmodernism. Again, someone like Calvino comes out of a late modernist tradition, a very strong late modernist tradition, such as Ulipo. Ulipo in France was a group of writers who experimented with mathematics. As mentioning mathematics earlier on, Ulipo was a group of writers where some of them, in fact, had a very strong training in mathematics and they were using mathematical forms in literature. I mean, broadly, they were trying to mathematize literature. So those kinds of interests, someone like Calvino came from. But Calvino has been largely discussed as a postmodernist writer. Again, because of his playfulness around forms. If you read Cosmic Comics, you'd see how he uses uh, these low forms, low art forms, and fuses them with much more complex experimental uses that, that actually go back to mathematics and especially uh, some of these ideas from cybernetics that he was extremely fascinated by. So I think there are continuities more than discont discontinuities here. And again, writers like Koetzi and others, I mean, there are ways of reading them as postmodernists or uh, modernists. So I, one final point that we make in response to your question, that sometimes we have to think of modernism and postmodernism as analytical tools and not just as historical periods. They're also analytical tools to engage with different kinds of literature. So just to give one example and I'll finish with this, Peter Boxall, uh, a contemporary modernist critic, he uh, wrote a book called Value of the Novel which I would strongly recommend for anyone interested in this particular angle that I'm trying to explore, modernism as a heuristic tool, modernism as an analytical tool, rather than modernism as a historical period. So what Boxall does in this little book, and this part of the Cambridge University Press value series. So there are these various books all on value of this, value of that. And this is one such book, value of the novel. So in value of the novel, uh, Boxall goes through the whole history of Anglophone novels, especially starting with, you know, again, people like Jonathan Swift and, and, and others. And he reads the whole history of novels as a modernist scholar. So he would read back 
some of these modernist concerns that we see with writers like Joyce and Beckett back to, you know, Swifts and, and Defoe's of the world. So it's very clear how in that kind of work, modernism becomes a set of aesthetic ideas that could be deployed across historical trajectories and not just in one historical period, the so-called modernist period, right? So maybe I'll, I'll stop there, but thank you for the question. Any other questions? If there is no further question, we'll end the session. I would like to thank Dr. Orko Shatrapadhyay for spending his valuable time. I would like to thank Dr. Sharda Rajkumar, Dean, School of Social Sciences and Languages, and Dr. Bhavaneshwari Ji, Head of English Division, and other colleagues of School of Social Sciences and Languages for their constant encouragement and support. Thank you, sir. Thank you, everyone. We'll meet tomorrow again at 4 p.m. Let me just thank take you. this opportunity to thank Professor Mukherjee and everyone for this very kind invite. And it was lovely talking to all of you. Thank you so much for your time. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.